You know, Amazon. Come here. Come here. We're way smarter than you're giving us credit for. Welcome to my human design experiment. Hello, and welcome back to Mystical Mac. If you are new here, thank you so much for joining. Uh, this video is going to be a bit of a rant, a bit of a negative rant. I'm super aware of that. If that's not really your vibe, no worries. Come check out another video or look through my videos. I have plenty of really fun videos with Adir. Um, any of the New Moon videos are just super fun to watch. So check those out if you're not really in the vibe for this. If you are, thank you for staying. Um, this is a video I really wish I wasn't making, but it's a video I feel that I have to make. If you have noticed, I am in themed attire today. Even have a cloak. Because guess what? I love the Wheel of Time so much, I've made up my own character. Her name is Clara Sedai, and she's of the Yellow Aja. Mm -hmm. Let's go. Um, I even have my own um, Ouroboros Great Serpent ring. This is how the rings should have looked in the show. The atrocities they came up with are just ridiculous because, yes, at the end of the day, sisters can wear other jewelry that can represent their Aja, and it doesn't have to be embedded into this ring. Um, yeah, that's a little nitpicky detail that really bothers me. We're going to get into some big details, though, some big, big things. Don't know why I called them details. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, social media, all that stuff, link down below. Let's just get right into this. Um, some of you may be wondering, why am I naming Rosamund Pike directly? She has nothing to do with the show. She's just an actress. No, she's the star actress. She's also supposedly been trying to get the show made for a long, long time because supposedly she wanted to, she just loves the book series and wants to adapt Robert Jordan's work into something that fans can see in real life. But really... What's been shown to me time and time again as I watch begrudgingly the episodes of the show hoping, just hoping, that they do something better. Um, it's been proven time and time again to me that she didn't want to actually have this beautiful book series that's been time tested, that's sold so many copies it compares to Lord of the Rings, that predates Game of Thrones, like she didn't actually want to put this into screen in an amazing manner. She just wanted to play the character of Moiraine Domondred, which, who can blame her? But to have the audacity to want to play that character and then just stand idly by while they completely disrespect and strip all reverence that they should be holding for the source material, that's just not cool with me. And so I'm completely comfortable naming her as one of the agents that outright failed Robert Jordan and his completely brilliant work. Of course, not without flaws. He was a flawed human. That is the wheel of time. To begin this video, I really want to read this touching foreword by Brandon Sanderson. This is the foreword from um, book 12. I'm on book 12 right now, and I listened to the books. I listened to the audiobooks, and I was tearing up when I was listening to this because it's just truly, I mean, it, there's just a lot of emotion in it. Brandon, um, Brandon Sanderson finished the Wheel of Time book series after Robert Jordan died, and this is what he had to say. In November 2007, I received a phone call that would change my life forever. Harriet McDougall, wife and editor of the late Robert Jordan, called to ask me if I would complete the last book of The Wheel of Time. For those who did not know, Mr. Jordan had passed away. It pains me to be the one to break the news. I remember how I felt when, while idly browsing the internet on September 16, 2007, I discovered that he had died. I was shocked, stunned, and disheartened. This wonderful man, a hero to me in my writing career, was gone. The world suddenly became a different place. I first picked up Eye of the World in 1990 when I was a teenage fantasy addict visiting my corner bookstore. I became a fan instantly and eagerly awaited the great hunt. Over the years, I've read the books numerous, numerous times, often rereading the entire series when a new book was released. Time passed and I decided I wanted to become a fantasy author, influenced in large part by how much I loved the Wheel of Time. And yet, never did I think that one day I would get that phone call from Harriet. 
It came to me as a complete surprise. I had not asked, applied, or dared wish for this opportunity. Though when the request was made, my answer was immediate. I love this series, and I have loved none other, and the characters feel as I have loved none other, and the characters feel like old dear friends from my childhood. I cannot replace Robert Jordan. Nobody could write this book as well as he could have. That is a simple fact. Fortunately, he left many notes, outlines, completed scenes, and dictated explanations to his wife and assistants. Before his passing, he asked Harriet to find someone to complete the series for his fans. He loved you all very much and spent the very last weeks of his life dictating events for the final volume. It was to be called A Memory of Light. There's more um, to this brilliant forward. Uh, forward. But this is all that I needed to, to read to you because he did. He loved his fan base so much that he spent the last weeks of his life working to get this series finished. Not even George R. R. Martin, who's still alive and well and good, writing football blogs, gives a shit about his fan base like Robert Jordan did. Because if he did, Song of Ice and Fire would be done. Is it? No. So there's that. Um, Robert Jordan deserved better. That's just point blank. He deserved better than this atrocity of a show that Amazon has created. So let's dive into why. Why did he deserve better? How did Amazon and Rosamund Pike single-handedly, double-handedly, ruin and completely failed Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time? Let's go in order. Silly rings and shit aside. So... There's this thing, right, that they supposedly wanted to age up the main characters. Aside from Moiraine, because apparently now she's a main character. Apparently now she's one of the top three characters, right? Um, which, let's just be real. Placing Moiraine at the center of that storyline is a change I excuse because, sure, it gives the star actress more of a place to take a little bit more precedence, um, more of a place to have newer audiences that aren't familiar with the book series, have someone that they've already seen in movies and things they have a face to connect to. That's fine. I could see that. To make her the main character? No. <laughs> uh, no. Sign that this is Rosamund Pike's Vanity Project number one. Because I know... No, I can't say I know legal reasons. I can very safely assume that this show and this showrunner wouldn't have been able to even get greenlit if they didn't agree to do everything that she wanted. So, um, because that's how much power the star has. Unless, you know, you've got a director like Spielberg. And, you know, funny enough, Spielberg would probably have a whole lot of reverence for Robert Jordan's work. So here we go. Um, so they decided to age up the main characters, the, the, the younger characters, right? Oh, sorry. Spoiler warning for everything. Leave now. Bye! Okay, you're still here? Great, let's go. Um, they decided to age up, uh, you know, uh, the, the main five or whatever. Rand, Perrin, Matt, Egwene, and Nynaeve. To supposedly avoid seeming like a young adult show, but then they end up writing the show as if it's a YA freeform show. <sighs> How did they do that? Yeah, okay. They rely on melodrama way too much. Honestly, like too many of the episodes, nothing really happens. People just show emotion and talk and it's not even really interesting shows as em shows of emotion or interesting talks the script is very dry or just completely overexposed most of the exposition completely given by Rosamund Pike which shaking my head duh but ugh um they add unnecessary tropes and silly plots um just to seemingly advance character arcs um, 
as if those characters don't already have plenty of information to go off of in the original work that is the Wheel of Time book series. So that's really interesting to me, um, right? They, they aged up these characters and added these sort of like mature content scenes where there's sex and there's this and there's that. And while they're completely stripping the Wheel of Time of what it actually is and trying to seem like a Game of Thrones knockoff with the name The Wheel of Time plastered on it, it also like just sort of makes the show look really, really silly. Um... Because it's not done well. None of this is done well. Like, there are YA shows that intrigue me more than The Wheel of Time. Motherland being one, which, by the way, it seems like they completely ripped off the Motherland intro or the idea of the Motherland intro with the tapestry and stuff like that. Even the song, even the intro song is so Motherland intro adjacent that it's kind of uncomfortable. So yeah, from what I was saying, they try to avoid by seeming like a YA show by aging up their younger characters, and yet they still completely come across as a bad YA show in the way that they write and just how lazy everything is. Um, like, it honestly seems like it was a first ideas show. <laughs> like, you know, you're in the writer's room, you have a problem to fix, and um, the first idea that comes to mind, you go, yes, that's the one, let's go with it, boom, we're done. A show like this deserves more. A show like this, or I'm sorry, um, source material like this deserves more. Source material like this deserves better. It deserves some time, some thought. It doesn't feel like they put any of that in here. Motherland has more time and thought than The Wheel of Time. And way less money and somehow is way more intriguing. So, <laughs> interesting. Um, the decision that the dragon can be male or female is a foundational decision that essentially should have let me know that they are willing to change anything in this show. Because if they're going to disrespect the source material to the degree of changing one of its foundational rules... The dragon has never been a woman, never will be a woman. The dragon is Luz Theron Telamon reborn. He will never be born into a woman's body, period. To dare to change that for any reason, I don't care what it is, it's not good enough, that just shows me now, unfortunately, in hindsight, just them telling us outright, we're using Robert Jordan's brilliant works as a rough draft from which we can loosely pull from and change and quote, quote, improve on whatever we want. They've improved upon nothing and ruined it all. Next, we have making the mystery, who's the dragon? instead of giving it to us at the start, like the book series did, and allowing us to see how the other characters fit around that story and how Rand sort of starts to discover that earlier on. Of course, this is a 14-book book series. So, um, it's obvious that, you know, Rand has to find out he's a dragon very, very early on in season one. And to draw that out and make the mystery, who is the dragon reborn, honestly, in my opinion, is one of the dumbest shit that they've ever done. Because there are so many more intriguing mysteries than who the fuck is the dragon reborn. Honestly, that's just evident in the fact that Robert Jordan didn't even want to hide that from us. He was very clear on who the fuck was the dragon reborn right away. And how many of us weren't intrigued to keep reading? Let me think a little bit more. Oh, well, definitely not everybody who's, like, loved the book and read up until four, book 14, and definitely not Brandon Sanderson, who's reread the books five million times. And you see where I'm going here? The show had the audacity to think that they had a better idea of how to navigate this story better than the man who wrote it. And this change is, is evident of that. Sure, okay, who is the dragon? Eh, fine, great mystery. No, it, it's not. It's not a great mystery because 
at the end of the day, it would have been so much more interesting to watch, to know that Rand is the dragon, but as the audience know, while everybody else in the show doesn't know, you know, not even Moiraine. Moiraine's still trying to figure out who the dragon is, but we, we know. That would have been so much more interesting. And you know what? It was. It was more interesting while reading the books. Um, so that was just... Again, faux pas. Next, um, I really disliked the the using book buzzwords but never paying them off, which essentially like just left readers like myself very annoyed. Um, and especially readers like myself who have experiences in the filmmaking industry, very annoyed. Um, but also it left non-readers at best confused and at worst, honestly, just completely misinterpreting those terms. Like my dad, whom now is listening to the books, but hadn't started before he started watching the show, thought Taviran had something to do with channeling. And you know why? Probably because she used that word once and then threw it out and nobody ever saw it again. Even though the idea of a Taviran is very important, and by now, that should have been well explained. And it hasn't, so, you know. Um, also, the Ajas, the existence of the Ajas, not really fully properly explained, and in my opinion, like, that is an area of exposition that I wouldn't mind being a little bit overexposed, because I know what they are, I know why they're different sisters in different colors, I know what the tower politics are kind of all about, but... Honestly, I don't know if a non-book reader even cares about those politics because they don't know what the hell is going on. Um, so next, Aes Sedai completely flaunting their status when that's only done when it's absolutely necessary in the books. The way Moiraine Rain entered the inn in episode one was completely disastrous. It was completely atrocious. Um... Because it set this precedent that Aes Sedai just go around flaunting their hideous rings and um, expecting everyone to know that they're above everybody else. As if they don't already know. Because they do. They do. Everyone fucking fears Aes Sedai. There's a reason they fear Aes Sedai. It's because... They are very powerful. They can use this magical source of power that moves the wheel of time. They have access to that. Why in the hell do they need to flaunt their authority? They don't. In fact, most of them walk like they're nobles. They're dressed like they're nobles. They talk like they're nobles. They have this regal air about them. It's talked about numerous times in the book. They have this sort of unbothered stoicism about them because in truth, when you are that powerful in a society of that sort, what do you have to be bothered by? The show completely crushes this brilliant mystery and intrigue that can be extended to the Aes Sedai by having every Aes Sedai we look just flaunting their ring and oh I'm an Aes Sedai and I'm all powerful and I can do all that no just no in the books it's very clear that the Aes Sedai know that they are servants of the people even though a lot of them lose sight of it <clears throat> black sisters um <laughs> not black in color black Aja if you don't know what I'm talking about this is not about race here um but they know, and in fact, they take the three oaths in order to sort of be trustworthy to the people. They take the oath of not speaking lies, of not creating weapons that will help people kill each other, and to only use the one power in defense of the innocent or themselves and their warders and against shadow spawn. There's a reason for that. And those three oaths carry in the way that Aes Sedai carry themselves. And that is with, yes, this sort of superiority, but not a flaunting of it. 
that just completely removed any sort of mystery and intrigue from the Aes Sedai characters, in my opinion. Um, and you know, that end scene could have done, could have been done so much better. Like, instead of just having Lan walk in, stand for like two seconds, weird, like weird as fuck, and then have Moiraine open the door, walk to the fireplace, look at the fireplace like she's about to channel shit out of it, turn to the ink, like it was all just too much. It was like, if this isn't Rose gets a vanity project hint number two, I don't know what is because that scene took way too long, took precious time from an episode that honestly could have used more time for better things. Um, and it could have been done in a way that was way more intriguing and way more mysterious um, in the fashion of Moiraine just, you know, casually walking into the inn, her warder following, people sort of like maybe our main characters like whispering, um, you know, Egwene had just, I think, uh, said something to her father. So she can be like, um, you know, father, look at her ring. Um, and then, you know, another off-screen voiceover could say, I didn't know they were real. And then maybe, you know, maybe someone else says, because the show loves to overexpose, she really, th is that a sister? I don't know, just something like that. And, you know, and then all she does is go up to the innkeeper and go, may I have a room and be done she looks like a noble lady master alvier would be happy to give her a room just by how she's dressed we did not need to know she was Aes Sedai in fact the fact that she flaunts it so hard completely ruins it and just gives Rosamund Pike more screen time for absolutely no reason um changing parents storyline uh results in fridging Layla and then is followed by Perrin leaving after that brutal murder which is just so unlike Perrin so unlike Perrin Perrin is such a morally um guided character that to have him kill his wife on accident tell nobody about it, go along with the Trollocs killed her by not correcting anybody, and then just up and leaving because some bitch he's never met told him to. Eh, none of that is parent to me. None of it. Um, but hey, for some reason we couldn't just keep parent's storyline like it was. I mean, I didn't mind the whole, like, got getting so caught up in, in his animalistic side that he accidentally kills someone. I just don't think that we had to make up a wife that he had to fridge. And for those of you who aren't aware, fridging is a trope that happens a lot where a female character dies literally just to move forward the plot of another male character. Um, yeah, it's outdone, it's stupid, and it's been done better. So if you're going to do something so cliched, try harder. Amazon um but like he could have easily done the same thing to Master Luan which is the blacksmith whom he apprenticed under and I think it would have had just as much of an impact but you know it wouldn't have been as violent gratuitous and probably as gory and whatever else it wouldn't have been Game of Thrones like because you know they're trying to make their own Game of Thrones not actually adapt to the Wheel of Time um yeah, that was really stupid, which honestly leads me into the fact that the way that they leave the two rivers at the end of episode one convinces nobody, absolutely nobody, nobody. Um, in fact, Robert Jordan, um, I, I listened to an interview by him, and he said he lived in the country, and one of the things he really wanted to incorporate into his series is just how stubborn country people are. How, you know, how sort of, if information doesn't come from a trusted source, they're not listening. And a trusted source meaning people they know from the lands that they know. Um, oh gosh, excuse me. People they know from the lands that they know, people that they grew up with. Um... If information is not coming from those sources, they don't care. 
They're not listening. They, you could say that the sky is falling. They're not going to believe you because they're just, they're tough. This is how they've survived this long, so far away from civilization. And the Two Rivers is very far away from civilization um, as the rest of the Wheel of, Time, Wheel of Time world knows it. And, um, yeah, the ending of that episode just, is, just completely throws that notion away. Um, and, you know, weirdly enough, this could have been easily fixed. You know how? By following the source material. I feel like I'm going to say that a lot. Um, for example, the show, much like the books, could have followed, or not followed, could have somehow let us know that all three of our boys were being followed by a fade and that they noticed that's how in the books Moiraine convinces them to leave because originally it's just the three boys she's trying to convince to leave because they're the only three that she's for sure is Taviran. And Egwene sort of just follows after them because she, I think, I don't know if she gets shown that she can wield the power. Um... I think so. I think something happens in the Two Rivers with Moiraine and she gets shown that she can wield the power and she becomes, you know, ambitious enough to just go with them and leave as well. And then, of course, Nynaeve follows suit because she wants to bring the kids back to, to Edmund's field. But um, originally, that's what happens. Moiraine tells them, like, hey, these, fa- the, the, these shadow spawn are going to come after you again. I know you know they were following you. I know you know you were being followed by a fade. And all three of them, like, essentially go, well, shit, yes, we were. Maybe she's right. Um, and that's way more of a compelling reason for them to actually leave the only place they've ever known, the place they want to grow old and die in. Um, especially being these stubborn Two Rivers folk that they are. And that is a big, big thing in the book, that Two Rivers folk are stubborn. Stubborn. Much like the country folk that Robert Jordan grew up around. Um, So, just like, and this happens more often than not. Like, flimsy, flimsy storylines, flimsy reasons for things that make no sense. This is just one of the really big ones that popped out to me. Um, And for some of you that might come at me and be like, well, it would have been harder to show the show Fade following them. You don't have to actually show the Fade following them. You know, in that scene, that first scene when we get Matt, Perrin, and Randall talking together, if maybe we could have not changed Perrin's storyline, instead of talking about Perrin's wife that didn't exist ever in any storyline, we could have been talking about how they were seeing the stuff of nightmares. Um... And then one of them is like, no, 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 it's okay. I don't want to talk about it. And then the other one is like, wait, did you see a dude with a cloak that didn't move? And then all three of them just like have a look within each other. And we all know via that very subtle but very effective scene, they have all been followed by Shadow Spawn, specifically a fade. Um, this also brings me to um, come back to that little note I have about like book buzzwords and things being used and then never being paid off um the fact that in winter night when Tam fights off that trollic we get an insert of the heron marked blade but no one ever says what it means or remarks it again is just fucking atrocious don't give us that insert if you don't plan on doing anything with it. It's irresponsible. It's lazy. It's stupid. Book readers. You know, Amazon. Come here. Come here. We're way smarter than you're giving us credit for. We all read. I'm still reading a very dense work of fantasy written by a very very good writer such a dense work of fantasy that you can find new things upon rereading and re-listening every single time so for you to think that you can just insert these little things from the book and readers are going to be like happy about it even though you never touch them again, no, we're outraged. 
I'm outraged. I don't know who else I can speak for here, but I'm fucking outraged. If you were going to show us the hair and Mark Blade, you were... You have to talk about it, and you haven't. You've done nothing to talk about it. And you know what? At this point, if you talk about it now, it doesn't matter anymore. It's forgotten. It's done. And I'm fucking livid over it. Because the hair and marked blade is a huge sticking point. The fact that Rand, a clear shepherd boy from a farm, is carrying around a blade master sword. It's a huge thing throughout the whole first few books as Rand learns to be to be worthy of that sword, that blade master sword, to to learn how Tam became a blade master probably in the first place or muse about it. Like there's so many different things that just sort of swirl around that heron mark. And for them to just completely disregard it and and throw it in like some sort of flash for book book people to like potentially maybe hook them to the next episode it's fucking lazy it's inconsiderate it's disrespectful go fuck yourselves um yeah also when it comes to winter night you did rand a really great disservice uh when it comes to how he takes tam uh to edmund's field because what happens in the book is they get attacked by trollocs and tam gets you know mortally injured as he did in the show but because their farm is a little bit further away from Edmund's field, it's actually a great act of heroism that Rand takes Tam from their farm to Edmund's field on their mare, Bella. It's the first time we see Rand Althor display heroism. It's very important that we see that. Because come the end of the first episode, I don't give a shit about any of those characters. I don't. And it would have been really cool to at least be able to give a shit about Rand. But we were so wrapped up in not giving any one character too much screen time, except for Moraine, um, as to not bungle up the who's the dragon reborn mystery, that we essentially completely did away with any of that and forgot to give us reasons to actually root for our characters. Okay. Um, where are we at? Yeah. So Matt's development didn't have to involve changing his family life to a completely cliched broken family trope. Should I drop the mic? I won't. I paid a little bit for this mic. I don't, I don't want to drop it. But <laughs> really though, it didn't. It really didn't. Um, I understand. I get it that there's some arguments by uh, the YouTubers that have been bought by the show that, you know, they're, they're trying to defend these changes till the end of time. And one of the ways they tried to defend the change to Matt's early storyline is because in the first few books, he really doesn't get a whole lot of development because... For great majority of it, or for great majority of those first couple books at least, he's under the influence of the dagger. So we don't really get Matt as himself. Um, and therefore we don't really get a lot of uh, chapters in his perspective. And therefore his character does not get as developed as probably a lot of people deem appropriate, um, you know, for the first season of a show. With that said though, I don't feel that there was any need to completely change change his foundation, his character foundation. Um, Matt, uh, once he does start to get development, he becomes a very, very compelling, intriguing character. In fact, um, he's kind of what I like to call like a trickster, trickster slash scoundrel with a good heart, with a great heart. Um, and that, in my opinion, is incredibly intriguing. Uh, and not to mention, of course, like his whole thing with the eel fin and the ale fin and, and how his luck develops and the memories, like there's so much to be done with Matt. And I understand that not a lot of that happens early on, but you know what can happen early on that can really feed into Matt's intrigue and Matt's development? We could, like Matt's always been a troublemaker and I hate how the show makes this like a ladies man. It's like, Sure, Matt likes the ladies, but he's like more of a, more of like a troublemaker. Um, and you know what? One thing I do love about Matt in the books, this is a side note, like let's forget about the show for a second. Matt in the books, he is a champion for consent. 
Like, I love that. I love that. He's like, I don't want to kiss a girl who doesn't want to kiss me back. And I'm like, go, Matt. Go, Matt. But anyway, um, you know, I think if the writers uh, and the showrunner and, you know, maybe Rosamund Pike, because obviously she had all the say here, um, had tried a little bit harder, they could have come up with something a little bit more interesting for Matt. In fact, Matt's family in the book is not broken at all. He has a very well-respected family in Emmons Field. In fact, his father, I believe, is part of the town council. His mother's probably part of the women's circle. And his two sisters are older in their teen years and, in fact, later go on to go to the White Tower um, and train to be Aes Sedai. So, yeah, uh, their storyline just, you know, that, just whatever, fuck that, um, apparently, but instead of completely changing his family to give him a cliche trope to move his character development along, we could have actually capitalized on the fact that Matt has, or Matt is part of this very well-respected family in Edmonds Field, and up until his early adult life, as we see him now, he still hasn't been able to let go of this childish, scoundrel, troublemaker thing. Um, and that can be juxtaposed with his very well-respected family. And I think that if you think a little bit into that, that could make for some really interesting early on plot lines. And, you know, you might have some ch to change a couple things around to make that really fit and work in the way that you want to. Um, but in it would stay true to Matt's character. Um, and, uh, and, you know, you can even choose to show that, you know, he does have moments of, like, considering his family and considering his friends. But that... Obviously, he's always going to go back to rolling the dice and he's always going to go back to having fun at an inn and dancing with the girls and, you know, and you don't have to make him a drunk and you don't have to make him a scoundrel to the degree where he's a criminal, but you can certainly make him somebody that is very opposite of the family that he's come from and that in turn makes him an interesting character in Edmonds Field, um, especially because it's a place where everyone kind of falls in line. Uh, so yeah, I really don't think that we needed to give Matt this super cliched broken family trope. Like, do you like how big I wrote cliched? This is the word. Yeah. Yeah, I wrote this really fast, so this probably looks a little bit like chicken scratch, but it's fine. Um, next let's go. Making Egwene Taviran. They seem to allude to wanting to make Egwene Taviran. Apparently there are four Taviran now instead of three, which is absolutely fucking atrocious um no reason for that in fact Egwene being Taviran just completely negates her brilliance and her wit as she crafts her own amazing arc um insert chapter 24 of knife of dreams honey in the tea all of that was Egwene's own work none of it Taviran. If you guys know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. If you don't know what I'm talking about, there's a pivotal chapter in Knife of Dreams, Book 11 of the Wheel of Time, where Egwene displays just a 101 guide of how to be a brilliant leader and how to help an empire fall from the inside. And you know, if she's got Tavir and forces at work for her, it completely takes away of the fact or takes away from the fact that she did that on her own with her own wit, with her own knowledge, with her own timing, her own persuasions. Because part of being Tavir and is things happen around you that are unexpected for most people things fall in line around you that are unexpected for most people and you know the way that that chapter falls in line if she were Taviran most of us would be like oh well she's Taviran so I guess that makes sense that it ended up that way but because she's not it makes it that much more impressive honey and the tea once you get to it you'll know it it's incredible and to make Egwene Taviran just completely takes away from her incredible agency and her incredible character arc which is arguably one of the best in the book. Next, Nynaeve's uh, caretaker, mother, whatever, being sent back from the White Tower because she was in rags. 
I don't have an issue with them giving Nynaeve a backstory, um, especially a backstory of a woman, you know, that cares for her that went to the White Tower and got sent back. What I do have an issue with is the fact that they're making the reason that the Tower sent her back um, a money issue when in truth the Tower is not elitist for money. The Tower has no reason to be elitist for money. In fact, if you are a queen and you go to the Tower to train as Aes Sedai, the Tower will treat you like any peasant. Um, your status as monarch is now removed. You get to be a novice like everybody else. You scrub pots, you scrub floors, you do all the things that everybody else does. It doesn't matter what the fuck you were before you came here. You're a novice of the White Tower now. So tell me why a place like that would send away a girl who's in rags. I don't understand. Now, what would make more sense is if said girl came, displayed that she had some sort of ability to touch the one power, but it wasn't enough. It was not enough for the White Tower to be like, okay, you can stay and train as a novice. Because guess what? White Tower is elitist, but not for money. They're elitist for the one power. And in fact, one of their biggest flaws... And one of the things that undercuts the White Tower the most in the book, as we know it, is this idea that they refuse to take in girls from under a certain age. And um, and so what ends up happening is a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of women end up outgrowing the age that they can actually go to the tower and they end up becoming wilders. Um, and I'm just going to insert this here right now. I'm really, really disappointed with the way that we seem to be completely doing away with the Wilder theory in the show. Um, so Wilders, right, in the, in the books, the reason that a girl goes to the White Tower, that a girl gets sent to the White Tower is because if she doesn't learn to wield the one power properly, she could kill herself. Um, and it ends up happening to a lot of young girls they'll touch the source they won't go to the white tower um soon enough they'll sort of contract a really dangerous crazy deadly fever sickness thing and they'll die because essentially they get burnt out from the power from the inside out because they don't know how to use it properly and that's part of the reason that it's very important that when a woman starts to show signs of channeling that she be sent to the White Tower. Now, there are way more cases than the White Tower cares to even think about or consider in the book that um, where a, a girl touches the source and then somehow is able to continue living by providing a sort of, <clears throat> a sort of block to the power within herself. And this block allows her to continue living her life um, while having access to the one power in very specific situations uh, where that block can be lifted. For Nynaeve, that is in an anger block. So Nynaeve is a wilder. Um, she doesn't, much like Egwene, she doesn't listen to the wind. The wind listens to her. Um, one of the few lines in the show that I find redeemable. Um, and she... She, what she does is when she gets really angry, she can, like, miracle heal. Um, and this has happened a lot in her wisdom career as the wisdom of Edmunds Field, where she sort of brought people from the brink of death um, because she's done everything she can with her poultices and her ointments, um, but it ends up not being enough. And she sort of takes their hand and, like, gets real angry that they're not getting better and all of a sudden that block lifts and healing surges through and and the one power helps her and she's able to miracle heal some people without the knowledge that she's really miracle healing them um with the one power now there's this weird thing that the show's doing where they keep mentioning over and over and over and over again that Nynaeve has only now touched the one power for the very first time. And I really hope we can do away with that bullshit because to take Wilders out of the series completely, I mean, 
you're just creating a lot of future problems for yourself because there are wilders in the sea folk, there are wilders in the ideal wise ones, there are wilders basically everywhere. The kinswomen are a bunch of wilders. Um, in fact, wilders is part of the reason why the White Tower begins to flourish again later on in the series. So um, I really hope that they just get away from that. I really hope that they're force feeding us this idea that she's only touched it for the first time because she hasn't and we're gonna find out but I don't know it, it's really stupid um but to go back to what I was originally saying about Nynaeve's caretaker story um it's just really stupid and unnecessary and misrepresenting of the white tower to me to have this little tidbit where her caretaker got sent away for being in rags when in truth it would have been way more convincing if she had been sent away after walking all that way because she could only really channel a trickle of the power and it was not enough for the white power for the white tower to keep her there and they sent her back and you know it would have created just as much contempt in Nynaeve because she wouldn't understand if she can channel, she can channel what's the difference because she's not part of the White Tower. She doesn't get the politics. Um, and it, in my opinion, uh, it, it just, it was not something that needed to be said that way. It was, it could have easily been changed, very easily. And it wouldn't misrepresent the White Tower and the show that they're supposedly trying to, um, to honor Robert Jordan with. Ugh. Next. This is a long one, isn't it? Um... Adding stuff from New Spring, such as Stepan and Karini's storyline, only serves to put Moraine further in the center of the story for absolutely no reason. There was no reason for the storyline with Stepan and Karini. None. We didn't need that silly ritual, um, that silly uh, ritual funeral at the end with all the chest bumping with Lan crying his art, his eyes out. We didn't need that. We really didn't. Um, Moiraine doesn't die for a long time. There are plenty of ways uh, that we can explore how a warder feels when their Aes Sedai dies as the show goes on. And it really didn't need to happen this soon. But you know what needed to happen? Rosamund Pike needed to have more screen time. So that's what happened. Next, mistaking the Aes Sedai being pillow friends as having undying love for each other. Now, it's common knowledge in the book that Aes Sedai in the tower, um, while they're novices and accepted, do become pillow friends every now and again. And if you know what pillow friends means, it, it's like, it, it's casual sex, basically. It's casual sex, okay? Um, it's not, yeah. It, it it's not Swan and Moiraine having an undying love. The Omerland seat waits for no for one woman, and that woman's not you. Go fuck yourself, Rosamond. You just probably have never played a lesbian role, and you probably or a bisexual role, and you probably just wanted to entertain that. So they added that stupid frivolous bullshit in. Um, but really, we didn't need that. Like, in fact, most Aes Sedai leave their pillow friends behind once they're raised to the shawl, and they just act like two sisters of the Aes Sedai. Um, and there was absolutely no reason for that, especially, especially when both of those characters go on later to have heterosexual relationships with men that they truly love. But, you know, for all we know that's not going to happen anymore because because they're not actually using the source material properly just they're just using it as a rough draft that was written by some high school student who didn't know anything which is incredibly disrespectful as i'm going to keep saying um next involving more magic just because or i'm going to say it again or because that's what rosamond wants um uh case in point the oath rod what was the point of Moiraine swearing that she wasn't going to come back to the White Tower till the Omerlin called her back on the Oath Rod? Tell me what was the point of that when one of the oaths she already holds is to tell no lies. I'm waiting. You don't have a reason either? Oh, that's right. Because if you've already sworn an oath that is magically binding to the point where when you're about to lie, you go... <gasps> 
Because the words can't come out because you are physically uh, disallowed to lie. Tell me why swearing a fourth oath on that rod, which by the way in the book has like, I don't know if I've gotten there yet, but it has like repercussions to like swear more oaths on those rods. Like it's not, it's not that simple. Tell me why we've already had that oath be known and now we're having her swear again on the oath rod. You know what? I'll tell you why. Because we needed close-ups of the ch- of Rosamund Pike and that chick who plays Swan Sanche being all emotional because because they're undyingly in love with each other. Stupid. Um, again, more magic where it's not needed. The step in storyline and that stupid, goofy, chest-pounding ritual at the end of episode, I don't even know, five or whatever. Stupid. Um, oh, the ways now can only be opened through the one power. Woohoo! Aes Sedai are all powerful, friends. They have no limits. In fact, the Ogier built the ways for the Aes Sedai, apparently, because they're the only ones who can open it. What? What? For those of you who don't know, the Ogier Ways are open via an Avendasora leaf, um, a, a stone Avendasora leaf. Avendasora is the species of this great, great tree that the Ogiers worshipped a whole lot. And they built the keys to the Ways based off of the Avendasora. And it's actually a really intriguing way to... Um, to open, to open the ways. I think it's a really cool thing. But also, you know, it makes sense because the Ogier created the ways, or not, I'm sorry. The ways were created um, so that the Ogier could travel between settings without, like, having to go through the rest of the world. Um, and not only that, the ways were created by male Aes Sedai. Which is why they're riddled with the corruption of the Dark One. Like, so the fact that Sidar, the female half of the Aes Sedai, can now open the ways is even more, like, out of alignment with the source material. Like, also, what, so, Ogier, who don't really like to fuck with Aes Sedai, they don't really like to fuck with human problems, what, they just, they needed an Aes Sedai every single time they wanted to go through their ways? Yeah, no, that seems stupid. Real stupid. Um, yeah, yeah, it's really dumb. Uh, the way that, uh, Shadar Logoth's story gets twisted. I really didn't appreciate that. It, like, it, it makes Matt taking that dagger seem really inconsequential. Like, Lan basically explained to us that the reason Shadar Logoth is such a dark and cursed place is because that the people who lived there didn't aid Manetherin when Manetherin was dying and therefore they became evil because of it. And it's just like, okay, how many towns and cities in time of war did the same thing and they didn't end up turning into pure evil that not even Shadow Spawn wanted to walk into? None! None did! Aww! That's why Shadar Logoth's story is so fucking brilliant and imperative. You know why? Because the actual true story of Shadar Logoth is that Shadar Logoth's people were trying to be real smart. They were like, well, if we want to, if we want to truly be able to fight on the level of the darkness, then we have to become like the darkness. And they set out on that plan. They set out on the plan to become just like the darkness, to become as dark as the shadow spawn in order to be able to correctly and effectively rival them. That plan heavily backfired and the entire city became consumed by an evil that was so dark, so dreadful, 
that even Shadow Spawn no longer wanted to enter that city. In fact, everyone in that city became completely consumed by the darkness that they'd all created once, you know, in that plan that they had, that they that had backfired. That, ooh, now that makes, that makes a cursed city make more sense. And it makes way more sense for us to look at Matt as a dumb fuck for going off and just taking something out of it. Whereas with rent, with um, the show's explanation, I'm just kind of like, yeah, I might have gone looking, searching through the cursed city too. Because, you know, I'm kind of a risky bitch like that and I like to touch tiny things. Again, just an example of them trying to give us a reason that's complete and utter bullshit. Um... When they could have honestly just given us the real one and it would have been way more interesting. Like, it's shit like this that I'm like, you clearly have no respect for Robert Jordan and the work of art that he created because the same words that Land spoke could have been changed into words that actually explain to you what I just explained to you. And I don't understand why that couldn't have been done. Next, Rosamond Pike, and I'm... (laughs) I don't even want to call her Moiraine anymore. She doesn't deserve that role. Um, in my opinion, um, sure, she plays it well, fine, but the fact that she's let the show completely disrespect and take a shit on Robert Jordan's legacy, just, yeah, you've fallen from grace for me, girl, um, you can be gone, girl, for real, thank you, um, but the way that Rosamund Pike completely cures Matt from the dagger, single handedly instead of bringing him to the tower like was the original plan in the books because Shadar Logoth is so cursed and things from that city are so tainted that you need like a full circle of sisters to do any sort of healing when it comes to it like it just sent it it it, it further proves this fact in the show that Aes Sedai are just invincible and they're just all powerful and they have no limits which is something that Robert Jordan does so much to get us to see is so not true he works so hard for us to see that even Aes Sedai have limited power the way that the ways work the fact that you know you need a no gear to navigate the ways, but not just that. Um, you know, you you needed a no gear to open the ways originally because the Aes Sedai didn't know where to find the Avendisora leaf. Um, you know, like there's so many things, and then just that the fact that there are certain things that can only be cured and healed by a circle of sisters together like it's so interesting because they push this like this narrative of Aes Sedai being super all-powerful or I should say I'm sorry Moiraine being super all-powerful it's just her friends she's the all-powerful one um but then you know but then they they have I don't know other nonsense like them getting completely overtaken by Loghain's army when Loghain's army didn't even seem that fearsome in the first place. They did not make it look that fearsome. They did not make it look like that many Aes Sedai and Warders should have died. Like there, there's just, so, yeah, it's like a lot of fucking mixed signals. I don't even understand, but I'm over it. Um, I'll just read you. I'll just read you the last few things that I said here in my notes. And then this was probably going to be it for this video. I'm not sorry at how agitated I am. I'm not sorry at how ranty this is. I'm really heavily disappointed in all of this. So I said, clearly this isn't Wheel of Time. It's a very, in all caps, loosely based, severely watered down, young adult, freeform version of something that borrowed characters in a magic system from the Wheel of Time. It's Rosamund Pike's vanity project. She's always featured... Only magic is done with respect to the books. Everything else is kind of like caution to the wind. And she has now the audacity to have a version of the Eye of the World audiobook narrated by her. Look, 
Yes, I read the first few books, but I've since shifted to the audiobooks because they're just easier for me to consume. And Michael Kramer and Kate Redding do a phenomenal job at narrating these books. Phenomenal. So much so that to have the hubris to put out a version where you narrate it just for shits and giggles because your head is big enough, in my opinion, is just stupid and outrageously disrespectful to the hours of brilliant narration that these two have put into every single volume of this series. And it just further, excuse me, it just further proves to me <coughs> Ooh. maybe she's learned some real magic maybe she doesn't want me to say this next part <laughs> just kidding I'm stronger in the power than her anyway um, it just proves to me that this really is her vanity project um, and it's really sad yeah, in fact, like, the last episode I did watch, um, I think was the, the Flame of Tarvalin. Oh, yeah, they've also changed the pronunciation of Tarvalin to Tarvalon. It's Tarvalin. Yeah. Um, that was the last episode that I watched, and there was not one scene that Rosamund Pike wasn't featured. Considering she's not supposed to be the main character of this show, I, it, why just why with every episode I become more and more sure that my assumption that this is her vanity project and that all she wanted to do was play Moira and Domadred like with every show with everything like I get more confirmation of that and it's really sad because to have the audacity to play this character whilst completely shitting on it, disrespecting the source material that put her out there in the first place, disrespecting the brilliant author that put her out there in the first place, the brilliant author that cared so much about his fans, as I read to you in that foreword, that he spent the last weeks of his life dictating an end a brilliant end I might add I haven't read it but everyone that I've I mean I shouldn't say everyone the only person that I know personally who's read it is my boyfriend but any fan out there that you research you know most of us love this series because the ending is so worth it even Robert's, even Robert, even Brandon Sanderson in his foreword says what a brilliant, magnificent ending it is. To disrespect this man and his work, to take a shit on his legacy in the way that she has by allowing Amazon to change so much of the show that it's completely defiled its essence and made it more like a Game of Thrones wannabe than anything else. It's just not right, and it's just not okay. And because of this atrocity, we're probably not going to see anyone try to adapt this book series, probably in my lifetime, if even after that. And you know what? After this bullshit, Amazon, I'm glad. Keep that shit shelved. Okay? It'll live pristinely beautiful in the form that it was meant to live in. And that is in book form. And hopefully Macmillan Audio doesn't allow any more Rosamund Pike versions of books to come out, of audiobooks to come out. Because Kate Redding and Michael Kramer, you guys have done a fantastic job. And your work is a hundred percent better than anything she could ever, ever, ever narrate. I, I don't even have to listen to her version of it to know it's true. 
because I've been listening to these books essentially since book four and those voices sound like home those voices sound like the characters I've came to know and love the characters that are butchered and defiled and ruined in this show that live the storylines that brilliantly put into the book are ruined and defiled and butchered in this excuse of an adaptation they should have completely renamed the show and told us how it was very loosely based on the Wheel of Time series. And then at least Robert Jordan's fan base would have been intact and maybe would have even followed the show. But we were all, in my opinion, or at least most of us, those of us who haven't been bought by Amazon with their Wheel of Time premiere tickets and whatever else yes I'm talking about Nablus I'm talking about Daniel Green I'm talking about those that claim to be fans of the book but will go up and down till the end of time defending these horrendous changes that have been made yeah we were all expecting a respectful adaptation and instead we got this a pile of shit on Robert Jordan's name So with that said, I bid you adieu. I don't know if I'm going to keep watching, to be honest. Um, I just get upset every time I watch it. I think I might just stick to rereading the series over and over again. And, you know, maybe someday if, if something better in the, in the ways of an adaptation for this comes along, I, maybe it'll give me more hope. I don't know. But this whole time, with all of the information that kept coming out about the show, I was really ambivalent, I was really skeptical, I was really unsure, and I was really scared that all it was going to be was Rosamund Pike's vanity project, and I'm really disappointed that that's exactly what it turned out to be. So thank you, Rosamund Pike and Amazon, for together ruining the Wheel of Time for people who have never consumed it before, and essentially alienating a very strong fandom that would have had your back no matter what. Also, you can make your own version of Game of Thrones. Too bad. Could have had something better, something completely different, something really well done. You could have had the Wheel of Time. With that, thank you folks. Stay mystical, stay grounded. If you watched up until now, I'm deeply grateful for you and... Uh, For one of my less ranty videos, check out my video history and subscribe for more. Oh. And may you always find shelter and shade.